Yes, yes. Hear me all right out there? Seven two five three seven six. Those are all three hundred seven numbers, of course. Okay. Or you can email me. Okay. Yeah. Right. Can't you too. So, without further ado, our uh, resident historian, for, that uh, is our uh, curator, I believe, at uh, uh, Shane uh, Frontier Days Old West Museum, uh, Mike Castle, and he's a wealth of knowledge and. And we've enjoyed this presentation in the past. So, Mike, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ken. You folks can still hear me okay. I can hear myself, so that sounds pretty good. All right, I, once again, thank you so much for the invitation to return and uh, give a little bit of the history here of uh, just every aspect of Cheyenne I seem to come up with. The topic I'm going to talk about, as you can tell on the screen, is about the aviation history of Cheyenne. We are, of course, the 153rd is hosting a wonderful air show right now, so this seems to be a very appropriate thing. The question is, how did aviation finally come to the city of Cheyenne? Cheyenne actually has a very significant role to play in the aviation history of the United States, all the way up to and including the time that the, that, uh, the Wyman Air Guard became active. So the best way to get started with any story is to start from the very beginning. This newspaper that you see here is from December the 18th, 1903. And if you're looking for the face of that paper, actually looking for new historic news, it's kind of hard to find. For my own students, I point out up here in the very top right, they have this tiny little picture of the article that says, New Airship. And it says, Under Absolute Control. And of course, what they're talking about is the Wright brothers. Now, as it is, unfortunately for the people of Cheyenne, and as a matter of fact, for almost everywhere else in the United States, we basically took the announcement that the Wright brothers actually flew with a grain of salt. We had seen charlatans come and go as early as the Civil War who said that they had known how to do powered flight. Unfortunately for the Wright brothers, no one really took them at their word. Well, we're very fortunate that, of course, that was the very birth of powered aviation and powered flight for humanity. But the Wright brothers themselves did not really advertise their accomplishment very well. And for the next few years, instead of going out and doing air shows, because there were no such thing, they went back to Dayton, Ohio, continued to modify and update their plane, quietly. So only the people around that community realized that something was literally up. As time goes on, however, eventually, 
Aviation starts catching on in other parts of the world, particularly in England and France, and in our newspapers here in Wyoming, those are the stories that actually make headlines. So we could be forgiven at that time thinking that aviation was a French or British innovation. As a matter of fact, in 1909, the world's very first aviation meet took place in Paris. And this is a picture of this wonderful aerodrome where they actually have all these dirigibles and other early aircraft that are on display. And everybody was anticipating that this was, again, going to be wonderful to display how Europe was ahead of the United States. Fortunately, the people in Europe had heard about Orville and Wilbur Wright and invited both of them in to bring their contraption to the Paris Air Show to see how it rated against everybody else's. Almost unanimously, everybody there realized that the <laughs> Orville and Wilbur Wright had been flying years before everybody else. This is actually the first time that the American public really began to understand that Orville and Wilbur Wright were successful and the Wright brothers had flown. Immediately after the Paris Air Show, a huge, a huge outpouring of enthusiasm for aviation poured across the country. We really didn't even know what airplanes really looked like. As a, like this particular picture, this is on the Cheyenne, front, or the Cheyenne, Wyoming front page showing the new year, 1910, the very next year. It doesn't look like anything like those early airplanes, but they had this kind of rocket ship ideal of this fantasy. So they were really excited. Everybody here was really excited about what aviation actually was. Well, we didn't have to wait long. That very same month, on January 10th through the 20th, we had the very first air show in the United States down in Los Angeles. People in Cheyenne who could go went. But one of the guys they liked to watch was a guy by the name of Louis Paul Hahn, who was a famous French aviator who flew up to 5,000 feet over Los Angeles, and that was a big deal. When we heard that he was in Denver a week after the air show and he was going to try taking off from Overland Park down there, People in Cheyenne were excited again, but were ex rather literally disappointed when the man could barely get off the ground, flutter like a barnyard fowl, and then land. And of course, nobody realized at that time he had just set another aviation world record for getting the plane off the ground at all in Denver at a mile high. Well, aviation continued to be an amazing thing, and people were wanting to see what they would be able to do, and it took almost another year before aviation started making inroads here in Wyoming. Interestingly enough, in January of 1911, a year after that big air show, the newspaper here in town got word that there was a young man who was building his very own airplane. He was a young carpenter by the name of Guy Stoddard. And he actually funded the plane by doing all of his jobs half in cash and half in piglets. And as the pigs grew up, he sold those piglets to buy parts for his contraption. Well, the newspapers uh, were very excited to hear about this innovation that he was working on, and so they invited him to actually have an air show once the plane was complete somewhere in the city of Cheyenne, and they were willing to help out as much as they could. They even went to the Cheyenne Frontier Day Committee, realizing that if there was any place you could get a large group of people to see an event like this, why not Frontier Park? And so they asked the General Committee if Frontier Park could be used as the very first launching place for aircraft in the state of Wyoming. Frontier Park, the Frontier Committee was very excited. They loved to have people in the seats in March, and that's exactly what they did. And this picture is the very first airplane in Wyoming. This is Guy Stoddard's little airplane. This is the best picture I can come up with. Unfortunately, when he was supposed to take off on March 14th, he and his friends erected the aircraft out on the center of CFD's grounds, and left it there overnight. Okay, I think you guys know where that, unfortunately, is going. The next day, when the crowds began to gather, poor young Guy Stoddard got into his plane, and after about an hour of tinkering with it and almost getting the plane to turn on, he unfortunately had to announce that his plane had been tampered with. One of the wheels had been loosened and the bolts stripped, the wires in his wings had been cut, and his engine wasn't performing. Perhaps somebody poured something into it. It, unfortunately, whoever va who basically sabotaged poor Guy Stoddard took his opportunity to be the first man to fly in Wyoming away. Of course, being a very poor man, it eventually went back to a garage where he'd been working on it on 18th Street, and it sat there. He himself went on to Laramie, met a girl, and left Wyoming and left the plane behind. So unfortunately, that's the end of that one little escapade. The first man to actually fly in the territory of Wyoming is this gentleman. His name is George Thompson. And he flew this airplane, not over the skies of Cheyenne, but the first airplane to lift off the ground into Wyoming skies was in Gillette, Wyoming on July 4th, 1911. So this gentleman, he was a pilot from Denver. 
So there you go, Denver's already getting into aviation before we are with their Thompson biplane that they were demonstrating. He flew and dazzled and terrified the crowd with his loops and spins. There was another man who was supposed to fly on July 4th down here in Cheyenne, and that was this gentleman right here. A famed race car driver by the name of Harold Brinker, who had raced the Denver Post train on several years and won, decided the only way to go faster was to have an airplane of his own, which he built. Unfortunately, he was not able to take off on July 4th because his engine got shipped to Cheyenne, Oklahoma, instead of Cheyenne, Wyoming. So he missed that opportunity. But he hoped to fly for Frontier Days before August. Well, as it was when he was getting ready to mount the plane at Frontier Park once again, as he was getting ready to mount the plane onto this contraption that he built, of all things, a gust of wind came up, picked up the plane, and smashed it into the grandstands. So, unfortunately, he was a little bit behind. He eventually did get his plane repaired by Frontier Days, but he had never flown it yet, so he was a little gun-shy about demonstrating it before a crowd. As it was, he did actually fly that airplane for the next two years around Cheyenne skies, but he never got very high off the ground, no more than 40 feet. Maybe he discovered he had a fear of height. And at the same time, he also did occasionally have a run-in flying around Sloan's Lake with flocks of geese. Uh, so he decided eventually that he would rather get back into racing cars instead of flying planes. So he got out of the business in 1913, and for almost everybody involved, we thought that was the end of aviation in Cheyenne. That wasn't the case. Of course, we're reading in the newspapers after 1914 how airplanes became incredibly important during World War I. Of course, the French, the British, and the American Expeditionary Force were flying aircraft over there. Occasionally, an airplane from the military would be brought and demonstrated at Fort D.A. Russell to raise Liberty War Bonds. But what really was amazing is that in October, or I should say, September of 1919, we got wind that there was something major afoot. Actually, not a major, it was General Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell was intending to try and demonstrate to Congress that it was possible to defend the coast of the United States by the air from either coast. And you, the only way to do that was to demonstrate that aircraft of that time could fly across the treacherous continent of the United States from one coast to the other. He and his compatriots came up with a test, continental air reliability and endurance test. It was going to have 74 different aircraft, including Martin bombers, SPADs, Fokker triplanes. They did use German aircraft and a whole bevy of different British aircraft as well to demonstrate which one would actually be the best. Believe it or not, when it came to October of 1919, everything was ready, and Cheyenne was one of the principal stops on this test, and there are several reasons why. One, many of these pilots had never flown across the country before, and they didn't know the way, so they needed a landmark they could follow. They came up with a brilliant idea that the one landmark that will take you from Chicago to San Francisco, and you can never miss it if you follow it, is the Union Pacific Railroad. It comes right to Cheyenne. Not only that, the fact of the matter is that the Union Pacific already found the lowest point across the Rocky Mountains made it a lot better for these early aircraft that they're talking about. So that, too, was an excellent thing to go for it. And the fact that we had Fort D.A. Russell also on the railroad tracks and at that point where they'd crossed the mountains, Cheyenne was perfect. And so here's a picture of the aircraft that are flying here in 1919. This picture was taken at Fort D.A. Russell. This particular aircraft is a British aircraft, a DH-4, and it's being refueled, and the pilot is getting a little coffee before he flies on. You might notice that the weather of Wyoming is there to greet them. Strong winds, lots of snow, made the whole endeavor very treacherous going through Wyoming. As a matter of fact, it was so treacherous that many pilots got lost because in snow squalls, they found railroad tracks but followed the wrong ones. Some of them ended up in Sterling, Colorado. One almost got all the way up to Casper before he realized something was wrong. Anyway, there is unfortunately a story about one pilot by the name of Lieutenant Edwin Wales who got himself lost around the most dangerous point on the entire transcontinental route. And it was right around this vicious mountain known as Elk Mountain. Always making its own terrible weather, always in the summertime or the wintertime being an awful place, it is in countryside like this that he lost the railroad tracks in a squall and decided he would follow the compass that he had in his plane to go dead east. So he should be right around, that should take him straight to Cheyenne. Unfortunately, at Overt Pass near Elk Mountain, instead of finding the pass, he found the mountain. 
he was the first man to actually get killed in Wyoming in an aviation accident. His engineer who was flying in the back seat survived, actually tried to get help, but by the time they got to Edwin Wales, it was too late. As it is, this is the wreckage that troops from Fort D.A. Russell found when they went back to the aircraft to recover it. They had to drag it out several miles from where it had actually impacted to take it back to Cheyenne and Fort Russell, where it would be able to be packed up on a train and continued. The transcontinental reliability test actually turned out to be a success. It took 19 days for them to actually fly from one part of the country. I take that back. I'm sorry, not 19 days, 19 hours, which is an incredible feat during this time period where the train would usually take four days. It's obviously possible, but because of wrecks like this, and Edwin Wales was not the only one, it was considered to be incredibly dangerous. Just the same, this inspired a group of people, particularly a guy by the name of Otto Prager, who was indeed something entirely different. He was with the United States Postal Service, and he was constantly looking for new things and new ways to make the mail travel even faster. Now that we've had an aircraft that can fly across the country, and the DH-4 that I had mentioned before was the perfect aircraft, now that we had that and the, tra the trail that could actually be followed by pilots, it was possible to establish the world's very first transcontinental airmail route. Now, to that end, in January of 1920, shortly after this affair took place, he sent representatives to our city to ask whether or not we would like to be on the route. And naturally, we said we would love it. There was anticipation that they would use the airfield that had been used at Fort D.A. Russell for the airmail and for the military. Unfortunately, Secretary of War Brown said that was not going to happen. It was a military post. Civilians couldn't use it. And so, putting their heads together, the city of Cheyenne and the mail service found this nice, flat, open piece of ground about a mile north of the Capitol building, and that's where they decided to put their brand new airfield. And they started the air mail service on September 8, 1920. This is a picture of the very first aircraft landing at our airfield today. It's actually at the southwest corner, kind of where the blood bank is right now. That's where, this air, that's where these aircraft are actually being shown. Some people are out there actually to see, uh, take pictures and everything else. Little did anybody realize that when this picture was taken, that that was almost the last time Wyoming skies would be without aircraft in them. So as it was, this airmail service was kicked off on September 8th and turned out to be a magnificent and very exciting thing that people in the United States love to follow. Because Wyoming was so high, it was made into its own division. Because it was so dangerous, it brought in the very best pilots that the airmail service was able to provide. As it was, the, here in Cheyenne, this is a picture of our airfield. We had six aircraft here. Four were always kept in reserve, while two were heading west and two were heading east daily. Originally, they did this only during the day, but thanks to one of our pilots by the name of Jack Knight, who in a winter storm, they decided to do another test in February of 1921, I'm not sure why, they decided to fly a night flight between San Francisco and New York City. And it was because of Jack Knight who braved a horrendous blizzard that was coming through Wyoming and Nebraska and Illinois and Iowa at the same time. He was the man that dared the weather and was actually able to complete the flight at night, and nobody had ever done that before. And he was one of our local pilots. An absolutely amazing man who made the transcontinental route possible and also proved that it was possible to fly at night relatively safely. But to, but to assume that it wasn't without risk is not to say that it wasn't a challenge. These pilots were amazing. They had no weather service to tell them what was going to happen. So they had to rely on the pilots that had already been on the route to find out where the weather was, how bad the winds were, what's happening around Elk Mountain. And so just like the old steamship captains of old that would describe the river to each other in port, the pilots did exactly the same thing. They traded stories and knowledge of what was happening on the route as they went from one place to the next. Most of the time, that was enough. But almost every pilot that was with the airmail service had several bad scrapes, including Jack Knight himself, the man that did that first night flight. He actually crashed his aircraft in a snow squall at the top of Telephone Canyon just east of Laramie, Wyoming. He was knocked out in the impact and found himself laying in the wreckage. Believe it or not, it was that very same day that he got up, went back to, caught a train back to Cheyenne, got another plane, and finished his route anyway. 
absolutely amazing individual. And that's him standing next to the wreckage of his plane once he finished his flight that day. Right. So it's kind of an amazing thing that these guys are willing to risk this and have that type of fortitude to make everything work. Just the same for the next six years, the airmail service continued to become better, faster, and more efficient. As a matter of fact, I believe they say that in the entire history of the airmail service, maybe 1.3% of mail that it carried was lost due to accident. That's an amazing record. The airmail service was phenomenal, and it grew and became more sophisticated with time. The aircraft were modified, the pilots got better, and they had a lighted airway system that would prove to be incredibly useful all the way across the United States. Now, as it was, though, the United States Congress was not interested in being involved with airmail. They wanted to turn it over to private contractors. In 1926, they passed the Kelly Airmail Act, and with that, started selling portions of the airmail route to various companies who would carry not only the mail, but most importantly, would also carry passengers. The route that came through Cheyenne, the most important one, as a matter of fact, this is probably a really phenomenal map to show you. This is the transcontinental route. You can see it goes through New York, Detroit, Chicago, and all the way to San Francisco. You might notice that going between Chicago and San Francisco, the very middle point of that entire route is Cheyenne. There's a man who realized that this would be a great route to have because he wanted to start his own airline. He loved building airplanes of his own. He thought he could do it very, very well. So in 1926, his company, a gentleman's name was Bill Boeing, decided to purchase what they called Commercial Airmail 18, which went between Chicago and San Francisco. And he and his company established what was known as Boeing Air Transport. The headquarters for this brand new airline wasn't going to be in Chicago or San Francisco, but right in the middle of the route. He decided to found his headquarters here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And it was here that they ran the entire airline, both with all of the pilot training, all of the scheduling, all the ticketing, everything was run out of Cheyenne. As a matter of fact, one of the things that Bill Boeing really loved about this whole project is that he was able to build his own planes designed specifically to fly right here. The aircraft that I have right here is his first airliner. This is the Boeing 40A. Now, one of the beautiful things about what he did when he bought this airmail route, he asked the pilots if they would like to join him and his new company, and almost all of them said yes. They loved his new airplane. Now, I don't know if you guys can see it. Do you see where the passengers sat? Yeah, the pilot's easy. The passengers sit right there, directly behind the engine, inside the fuselage. Four of them. It's a good thing the hops were only about 70 miles at a time, because there's no way to get any help if you had any trouble as a passenger. Well, Bill Boeing realized that this is a little bit too adventurous for most people who might want to fly. As a matter of fact, most people didn't want to do it. This was the age of barnstormers, wing walkers, and things like that. Most people saw aviation as something dangerous and unique, not a way to get around. Bill Boeing decided he was going to build his next airliner, and this is probably beginning the trajectory of Boeing, Boeing Aircraft Company from this point forward. Oh, before, before I do that, this is what he built here in Cheyenne. So how is his company? You might recognize that building. It's the old headquarters building for Cheyenne's airport. It's the one that sits next to the airport post office. That is the headquarters for Boeing Air Transport. Right. An absolutely amazing thing, and that's where the entire company was run. In addition to that, here's the rest of the facilities that he had built. Those five small buildings you see in the front are the airmail hangars that were built after 1924. And that large hangar you see there was built in 1929 and was the largest hangar in the Rocky Mountain region. At this point, Denver is beginning to think about an airport. But Cheyenne already has one of the largest airfields in the United States. They also go ahead and pave their runways. You can see right back there. Now, as it is, Amidst all of this, he is building other airplanes to fly and be tested out of Cheyenne. This is the Boeing 80A, it's supposed to carry 14 passengers. It was known as the Flying Pullman Car because it had wood paneled walls, leather cushioned wicker seats. It also had china sconces, brass fixtures, and you could even open the windows in flight if you wanted to. I don't know why. <laughs> Neither did he after a while. But just the same, even with this very luxurious ability to fly, the pilot and the co-pilot were responsible for the 14 people behind. Well, I should mention it also had a bathroom. Right? That's kind of important. 
Unfortunately, the co-pilot or the pilot could not always be available to tell people which door went outside and which one went to the bathroom. <laughs> so there was still kind of a little bit of a few problems to work out. Well, believe it or not, Bill Boeing realized that there was really a very difficult time and so did the company about trying to get passengers to fly even here. At the same time, in San Francisco, a man by the name of Steve Stimson, who was a ticket agent, ran across a young woman by the name of Ellen Church. She was desperate to get into aviation, but this was a men's world. This was a men's job. And there were no aviation opportunities for women. She persisted, and Stimson, who had worked for steamship companies, realized that maybe the best way to make people feel comfortable is to have somebody that would attend to their needs in flight. And if you could convince a young woman to fly on the, one of these airplanes, maybe that would convince the flying public that this was safe. So he and Ellen Church wrote a letter to their bosses here in Cheyenne and asked whether or not they would even consider having people, young women, known as stewardesses or couriers or what you wanted to call them, on board the planes to see if people would be interested. Fortunately, the men here in Cheyenne thought that was a great idea and this picture is in May of 1930, and here you have, thanks to United Airlines, a picture of the very first eight stewardesses in history. They were trained here in Cheyenne. From May 4th to May 8th of 1930, they were trained to do everything, including refueling the plane, weighing the passengers, and so on and so forth. And once they were trained after four days, they promptly got snowed in for two weeks, <laughs> and then got on their planes, and began to make history. These young ladies are the first stewardesses, and of course, every other airline realized what, how wonderful they were to have on board. Passengers were absolutely thrilled with this. The whole institution of stewardesses and flight attendants starts here in Cheyenne. So that's a nice thing to add. Now, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that United Airlines quickly comes on to the scene after this. Boeing Air Transport absorbs several other smaller companies for to become United Airlines. The company decides to move its headquarters to Chicago, but they keep their maintenance base for all their aircraft here in our community. Many of the men who are working on the aircraft had started with the airmail service and were now employed by United Airlines to maintain its entire aviation fleet, all 70 aircraft here in our community. Eventually, from a couple hundred, this would eventually grow to 800 and then continue to grow through the 1930s. This is a picture of the United Airlines maintenance base, the largest in the world, about 1936. Right? We even have our fountain already put in place. That was established in 1935. So there you have the whole facility. And it's amazing what happened here. The men who were responsible for actually maintaining these aircraft and the one that they started with that was really wonderful, this is Bill Boeing's third airliner. This is the Boeing 247. It's an all-metal plane with one wing instead of two. This is the beginning of modern aviation. This aircraft was flown at, across, uh, from Laramie to Cheyenne and back again on the Lincoln, over the Lincoln Highway. This was tested here in our skies. As it was, it also carried 14 passengers and was the fastest aircraft of its type when it was first launched. The men who took care of it were phenomenal. They were figuring out everything by the seat of their pants as they went. Here you have, one of the, you have a group of them actually installing what they call as a de-icing boot along the front edge of the wing. In order so that the pilot, if he sees ice forming on the wing, he flips a switch, that tube inflates, the ice cracks off, and the plane is able to fly again. This is the first time anti-icing equipment is ever installed on an aircraft. These guys also are the first ones to put variable pitch propellers on aircraft. Radios that can talk from the air to the ground and back again on aircraft. Cabin heaters, thank goodness, on aircraft. The list goes on and on. And all of these new innovations that make commercial aviation comfortable were installed here. Not only that, but these guys were so good at what they did, other airlines and a whole bunch of scientific organizations wanted to come and see what was going on here in Cheyenne. This particular, these next couple of pages are from Newsweek, but even popular mechanics came here. And here they take a look at the men of the Cheyenne maintenance base pulling in an aircraft for maintenance. These men could pull in one of these aircraft, take it completely apart, <coughs> recondition it, check everything out, refurbish it, and put it back in the air in four days. It was absolutely incredible what they were able to do. And other companies and other countries came to Cheyenne all the time to see how United was able to do these wonders of aviation. And they included things like Aeroflot from Russia, Air France, Imperial Airways from Britain, 
and later on in the 1930s, Lufthansa. So they all came to Cheyenne. As it is, the Boeing 247 was still at the very beginning of its life when it got superseded with a huge advance in aviation. The next comes on is the DC-3, this magnificent aircraft, which one is parked on the apron over, in Chi over here right now. United wanted one of these planes was actually, or, and wanted actually to have this in its inventory, but Douglas was having a difficult time making the plane perform up to specifications. United invited Douglas to bring one of their prototypes to Cheyenne and have these men, with their experience with aircraft, find out what was wrong. And as they had done before, they took the plane apart, put it back together again, and found out and gave a 200-page report of what was wrong with the DC-3. First and foremost, your plane's underperforming because the metallurgy in its piston heads was wrong. I mean, that's how good they were. They could go even into the metallurgy. After this plane was repaired and modified to the specifications by the crews here in Cheyenne, it became the world winner that it later became. So it's an amazing thing to see how we contributed to that as well. But here's one of my favorite pictures in the whole presentation is one of these DC-3s under maintenance inside the Cheyenne hangar. I love this picture because of the men wearing their white uniforms and their bow ties. Of course, they're very nicely dressed up for the shot, but I wondered why white uniforms. Well, to give you an idea of how innovative these men were, they wore white just in case they found a leak around the airplane tell where that leak was and what system it was. They wore white so they could see the different fluids and know what was going wrong. If it was black, it was oil. If it was blue, it was hydraulics. If it was red, it was from the transmission. If it was green, it was coolant. They colored the fluids, and of course now we do that in almost every vehicle we have today as we know the fluids by the color that they had. But these guys here in Cheyenne came up with the idea. So anyway, wonderful picture. With all of the innovation that these men had through the 1930s and the importance that they had for commercial aviation, it was natural that at the outbreak of World War II, this would be a place that the United States military wanted to get involved. In March of on March 11th, actually, 1942, the United States Army Air Corps announced that Cheyenne was going to be the location of Modification Center Number 10, which would be eventually the largest center of its kind anywhere in the Rocky Mountain region. This wonderful picture you see here is what the, this plant run by United Airlines was going to do. It was going to recondition B-17 bombers for fighting anywhere in the world. The concept was simple. They would roll the B-17s off the production line as fast as possible without stopping the production. Then, to modify them to fly in desert conditions, Arctic conditions, jungle conditions, long ranges, as reconnaissance platforms, or to upgun them and keep ahead of the enemy in the air, it would be brought to modification centers like Cheyenne, and all the latest and greatest technology would be incorporated here with never having to slow down production off the production line. This is amazing. Eventually, the crew for United, when they took this on, grew from 500 to almost 1,500 people working seven days a week, 24 hours a day. As it was, this is a picture of the original modification center number 10. It only had two buildings, but it had almost had uh, 17 aircraft in production at any time. Frequently, you would have over 100 aircraft parked around these two buildings. Eventually, this needed to be expanded, and this small neighborhood you see here was moved from the dirt road at that time called Del Range. That neighborhood was moved, put into the avenues, and Del Range was moved a little further to the south and to the west. And that is to make room for the expansion for another very large portion of the building, and there you have the third hangar that's there, which I might add is still there. This is building number 16 on the air guard grounds. So there you have it. But anyway, so you have the lean-to, you have all of that stuff that's still there, and the modification center continued. As it was, it's absolutely amazing how many people were involved, as I said before. This picture kind of shows the expansion of the airfield. Now, the original portion of the airfield you can see Right over here, there's the original United Airlines. There's the VA hospital out there. Here is modification center number 10. Instead of dirt grass or gravel runways that we had before, the Army Corps of Engineers poured enough concrete in the runways for this modification center to build 15 Empire State buildings. And that's in order to handle all the traffic that's going through. Because Cheyenne was only a town of 20,000 people, they did not have enough housing for all the workers that were in this plant. And so you had places up by Capitol Theaters today here in Cheyenne known as Carryville Acres under construction. 
All around Frontier Park, down here at the, at the front of the picture, was a war workers camp known as Frontier Villa. And there's one more that was built called, uh, it was originally called Van Tassel Terrace. It still survives in Cheyenne on the south side, and it's now known as Pinewood Estates. So we do still have some of the things that are in this picture, of course, that are still part of Cheyenne. Now, inside the building, these people were working marvels. As soon as somebody, whether they were on the front line or on the engineering drawing board, came up with something new, they were putting it on the plane and making the parts for it. They made millions of parts to make these B-17s as they were being modified. Here we have pictures of United Airlines crews working on the nose of an early model B-17G. Here we have other pictures, and this is one of my favorite. This was actually designed by the people at the modification center. If you look at the original copy of the B-17, the tail gun is a bad place to be for many reasons. First and foremost, you're in the tail of the plane. You're the first thing that the enemy is going to hit. The second thing is the original canopy that the, that the gunner was in was tiny and filled with metal and had windows maybe about this big to see the oncoming planes of the Luftwaffe or, or the Imperial Japanese Air Force. Very hard to see things. Not only that, to keep you protected from oncoming fire, you had a piece of canvas wrapped around your 250 caliber machine gun nose. The men here at Cheyenne decided, no, 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 that's not going to work. They decided to redesign the tail of the B-17 to become what's known as the Cheyenne turret, a modification that went to all B-17s afterward with a large open plexiglass opening and an armored shield for that gun turret. The crews of the B-17s loved this modification, and they didn't even ask for it. But the men of Cheyenne were able to put this together and put that on those planes. As a matter of fact, the B-17 that is parked here at Cheyenne has a turret just like this on the back. So I wonder if it's come home. I don't know. But just the same, wonderful things to see. Of course, I keep talking about the men who are involved with putting these, in, these magnificent aircraft together, but I'd be very remiss if I did not mention the fact that almost half of the people working in this plant were not men at all. They were young women. And here we have some wonderful pictures taken by United Airlines of their crews. These were our own Rosie the Riveters that occupied every aspect and ran a good portion of the operations in Modification Center 10. As it is, the two young ladies that are here are probably college students who got a summer job while going to either the University of Northern Colorado or CSU. It was a program, and they got bussed up here every day to help work on these B-17s during the summer. But anyway, so we had our own Rosie the Riveters and these wonderful men that had been working before over at the uh, maintenance base doing what they could for the production of the war. It's absolutely amazing to think, and here's the last picture we have of the B-17 plant in operation. By this time, the planes aren't painted. They're already, we're so late in the war that being attacked by enemy aircraft is becoming very, very rare. Or there's no need to try and camouflage yourself anymore since we're flying in formations of hundreds of planes. So these planes are now brilliantly silver aircraft. This is taken around July of 1945. By the time this picture has been made, it's absolutely amazing what happened here at Cheyenne. To begin with, in 1942, Cheyenne, when it first started, produced 407 planes. In 1943, the number had jumped to 2,376 planes. And by the end, including some B-24s and Canadian PBY Catalina uh, ocean-going aircraft, Cheyenne produced 5,736 B-17s for the war. If you take into account how many planes that is, 5,700 planes is about 46% of all B-17s used during the war. This was an amazing production. It was an incredible contribution that the city of Cheyenne and the people of Wyoming made to helping to win the war. Unfortunately, after World War II, this became obsolete. As a matter of fact, with a B-29, the B-17 was already running down its production even before the atomic bomb was dropped. This picture is taken in July of 1945. This is probably some of the last of these aircraft to come through. When the war was over, it was anticipated that Cheyenne's glory was going to continue. Here we have a maintenance base that would easily handle any aircraft that United could conceive of. And we were ready for it. And so Cheyenne anticipated that its future was going to be in the center of the aviation world as before. Unfortunately, like has happened to us before with steam locomotives, technology caught up with us. 
At the end of the war, this aircraft was becoming available by the hundreds to airlines around the United States. This originally was known as the C-54 Skymaster, an aircraft designed to fly from the coast of, west coast of the United States to Australia. It wasn't a short-ranged aircraft at all. The airplane with its four engines and pressurized cabin could fly over mountains, it could fly over storms, and have enough range that it could get just about anywhere that the old aircraft that United had relied on before just could not do. And it could carry 56 passengers, where a DC-3 could carry 30. When this aircraft came available very cheaply to United and other airlines, it made perfect sense that this was going to be their future. Unfortunately for Cheyenne, the United States Army, our, our Corps, the United States Army Corps of Engineers had built a brand new plant just for this plane in San Francisco. And that's of course because that's where it was going to be operated was in the Pacific. When United was offered that plant, it had an important decision to make. Was it going to continue the relationship with Cheyenne and retool the older facilities here for this new aircraft or take over a brand new facility designed specifically for them? Naturally, they decided that they were going to move to San Francisco. So when the C-54 Skymaster, which now could fly all the way to Hawaii on one tank of gas, that moved the center of United's route, not from, uh, it was really from Chicago to San Francisco. The center of the route was now between New York and Honolulu, and that was pretty close to San Francisco. So as it is, they made the perfect decision for them but it was a devastating tragedy for Cheyenne. United left to go ahead and take advantage of the new technologies that the war had brought. Now that of course does not mean that this is the end of what aviation is going to do here in Cheyenne. The modification center still stood for many, many years. The two big buildings that you see on the far side stood until after they were hit by the tornado that went through here in 1979. And so much damage was done to them, they couldn't be saved. Building 16, however, continues to survive today and continues to be modified for the use by the 153rd. What I think is wonderful about this picture is that the future is here. It's quiet and much more subtle. But the United Airlines made a decision to keep supporting the people of Cheyenne because we had been such good neighbors and friends to them. They couldn't leave us be. And so, right here, next to a hangar that is marked with the Army Air Force operations, this is 1946, just before the Air Guard takes it over. Right next to it is the original office buildings for the Modification Center, and they are being modified to become the stewardess school for United Airlines. And so, very shortly after that, all of the stewardesses that United had for this brave new world of aviation, where people weren't afraid to fly, but almost insisted on the ability to do so, our friendly skies would be born here and would continue until 1961. That whole story is for another time. All right, because we're getting close to the end, and I realize that we are running out, but I want to thank you very much for help, make me, well, helping me go through and enjoying, I hope, this early walk through Cheyenne's aviation history. I again, uh, thanks for coming out on a short notice on our uh, change of time, and I think Bob and I probably owe you lunch again this year. So. All right, I'm sure you will. Well, that kind of concludes what we're doing. Terry or Doug, do you have anything for the good of the order? Thank you very much for attending. It's a nice day going home. Yes. Doug's got some here. Yeah, yeah I'm sure again, it's important. Thank you, everybody, for coming. A couple of years, great to see faces, uh, you know, names to faces again. Uh, appreciate you coming out. And one final thank you for Terry Wilkerson for his uh, uh, dedicated service to the retirees for the past. How many years? 11, 11 years. So thank you, Terry, when you have the opportunity. Have a great year. Keep in touch.